Everyone knows that too much booze can lead to disaster. But disasters, even booze-related ones, come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. What exactly does a booze-related disaster look like? A booze-aster, if you will? Well, we're glad you asked, because today we're popping the cork on the two biggest booze disasters in history. Before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Food Channel. After that, please leave a comment and let us know what other food-related disaster stories you would like to hear about. Okay, last call for Weird History. There are a lot of dangers to worry about in life, but nobody expects to be drowned by a tsunami of beer, an experience a lot of people would probably pay money for. However, on October 17, 1814, a small neighborhood in the heart of London was tragically struck by a 570-ton wave of golden suds after a vat in a nearby brewery exploded. The vat belonged to the Meux & Company Brewery, which had been operating at the same location in the St. Giles Rookery for nearly 50 years. It had become the city's fifth largest producer of beer, and they had the stock to show it. But due to improper containment of pressure, a vat of the fermenting beverage burst, setting off a domino effect that caused vat after vat to explode. Ultimately, almost a million and a half liters of beer would be sent rushing into the poverty-stricken streets of downtown London. Again, it may sound like an elaborate bachelor party, but that's roughly half an Olympic swimming pool suddenly blasting through the streets. People were drowned, crushed, or otherwise obliterated in the wave of beer as walls crumbled, homes collapsed, and basements were flooded. With no proper drainage systems in place in the city, people had no other option but to wade through the depths of the muddied brew in search of their loved ones. In Greek mythology, Cassandra was a priestess cursed to know the misfortunes that would befall people, but never be believed when she tried to warn them. And, in an example of life imitating myth, only an hour or so before the explosion, a worker at the brewery noticed something was wrong with one of the three-story tall barrels of beer that he was inspecting. The barrels, which had the capacity to hold close to 150,000 gallons, or 1 million pints, were secured with numerous thick iron hoops, similar to those used to secure wine barrels. But the inspector noticed that one of those 700-pound rings had slipped off. The inspector warned the floor manager, but the floor manager was unconcerned. In fact, he even went so far as to confidently declare that no harm whatsoever would ensue from the fallen ring, because it happened all the time and nothing ever went wrong. We assume he sang a different tune after the accident, but at the time he was confident enough to tempt fate, and fate went all in. Within an hour, the manager, who probably didn't get a bonus that year, was proven to be very wrong as a beer flood nearly wiped out the entire infrastructure of the surrounding city. Oops-a-daisy. So how could one slipped ring do so much damage? Well, without the added structural reinforcement provided by the iron ring, the pressure within the barrel caused by the 10-month-long fermentation process became unbalanced and suddenly exploded sending its contents spraying across the storage room like a drunk on a roller coaster. What happened next was essentially a worst-case scenario. Every barrel in the brewery, large and small, began to explode as the shockwave of beer splashed through the room. Tragically, the flood rushed past the doors of the brewery and filled the drainless streets with foamy liquid. And while streets paved with beer sounds like one of the songs Fievel Mousquits sang about America, we assure you, the reality was a lot less fun than you're picturing especially in one of the city's poorest neighborhoods where entire families lived in basements. Despite the morbidly comedic concept of the streets literally flooding with free booze, Londoners were certainly not entertained. In fact, the devastation that resulted from the event was compared to a large natural disaster and was recorded as being one of the most melancholy accidents we ever remember. And when they say melancholy, they mean just outright sad, to the point of depressing. For example, in one case, the flood took the lives of a family of mourners who'd been holding a funeral for their son in a small basement. The beer filled the room too quickly for them to attempt an escape. We imagine their own wakes were held on the ground floor, or maybe on a boat. The wave also took out a young girl who was crushed by a wall that had given way under the sudden force of the beer. Numerous others were carried away in the flood's wake to drown. And despite the fact that panicked family members scoured the ponds of brown liquid in search of surviving kin, a total of eight lives were lost, all of whom were women and children. <laughs> 
When all was said and done, the brewery had lost the vast majority of its stock and the London neighborhood was left with the remnants of a disaster to clean up. However, when the owners of the brewery were brought to court regarding the incident, they got off without even a slap on the wrist. They say justice is blind, but she was also probably tanked that day. How did the brewery manage to avoid responsibility for obvious negligence? Well, despite the fact that an inspector had identified the problem and reported it to a superior who ignored the warning, the court determined that the event was simply a terrible accident. The deaths that resulted were described as an act of God, although, as far as we know, he was not one of the owners of the brewery. No one was ever held responsible for the oversight. The brewery almost went out of business after the disaster, but the British Parliament paid it hefty restitution for its losses, and they managed to keep on brewing. Glad it worked out for them. Most people don't bounce back from a beer flood. We can think of eight, specifically. Russia really knows how to party until something goes terribly wrong. Just ask Rasputin. Another dangerous celebration took place on May 9, 1945. In case that date doesn't ring a bell, allow us to explain. During World War II, the German army inflicted numerous atrocities on the Russian people, leaving them angry and overcome with grief. And after spending years being physically and mentally beaten down and literally starved by war and dictatorship, many were completely terrified of what may come next. Then, on May 7, 1945, deep within the grips of war, depression, and hopelessness, Hitler's Germany finally surrendered and the whole world rejoiced, especially Russia. In fact, when they found out, they celebrated so hard, they somehow managed to completely run out of pretty much the only thing you would never expect Russia to run out of. Vodka. As Steven Spielberg movies teach us, during World War II, Hitler was so distracted trying to beat Indiana Jones to various magical artifacts, he let the war slip through his fingers. And on April 30th, 1945, when defeat seemed all but a certainty, Hitler snuffed himself out in his bunker. Once he was out of the picture, things rapidly came to a close in Europe. On May 7th, 1945, Germany officially surrendered to the Allies and called off its armed forces. The good news quickly spread across the world, and one by one, the United States, Canada, France, Britain, Italy, and everyone else stopped everything to celebrate the dictator's defeat and the end of the brutal war. And then, Russia found out. It was 1.10 a.m. on May 9, 1945, when the news finally broke in Russia. The radio suddenly crackled to life with the voice of Radio Moscow's chief announcer, Yuri Levitin. Apparently not one for flowery rhetorical embellishments, Levitin simply said, Moscow is speaking, fascist Germany is destroyed. It wasn't eloquent, but it sure as heck got the job done. And it was at that precise moment the Russians decided to show the rest of the world how to really celebrate the end of World War II. Even an ordinary impromptu celebration usually calls for a drink or two, so it makes sense that when you're celebrating the end of the biggest global conflict of all time, you might have a little more than that. How much more? Well, if you're Russian, a lot more. In fact, it took a mere 22 hours before the entire country suddenly found itself faced with another crisis. They had completely run out of vodka. For context, they ran out of booze so quickly, Joseph Stalin hadn't even officially announced the German surrender yet. The great leader had yet to take his bow, and the country had already run out of its national beverage. In the US, it would probably be a huge news story, but we imagine the news was slow to spread in Russia because even the reporters were too busy partying. For example, one later wrote, I was lucky to buy a liter of vodka at the train station when I arrived, because it was impossible to buy any later. There was no vodka in Moscow on May 10th. We drank it all. So how did Russia, of all places, run out of vodka? It's still a good question. We do know that it wasn't because of the war. In fact, vodka production didn't stop or even slow down during the conflict. It had been integral to Stalin's national defense strategy, and the Soviet budget was dependent on it. That being the case, one would have thought that there would always be more than enough of the stuff to go around, especially after Stalin insisted that the government directly and openly promote the greatest expansion of vodka production possible for the sake of a real and serious defense of our country. But somehow, they still ran out in 22 hours. The depletion of the vodka supply becomes especially shocking when considering how its production has historically taken precedence over everything else, including food. Even in times of famine, the production of vodka remained steady. In his book, A History of Russia, Walter Moss described a time of famine in the 1930s, 
Stalin ensured that sufficient grain and potatoes were still available for vodka production, and vodka revenues in this period provided about one-fifth of government revenues. So basically, Russians would ask for food and be told their food was being used to produce vodka. Then they would ask for vodka and be told it was all out. The let them eat cake of Soviet Russia. Now that is a booze-related disaster. So what do you think? What crisis surprised you the most? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other weird history food videos.